In this video, we are going to investigate optimization with inequality constraints. That is, we consider the problem of minimizing a function f of a real vector x, that is an n-tuple of real variables, subject to an inequality constraint given by a function g of x. In fact, g can be a vector function and the inequality is then to be interpreted element-wise. In other words, we allow several inequalities. Eventually, we are going to combine this with equality constraints. That is, we are going to consider problem of minimization of f of x subject to an inequality or possibly a set of inequalities given by g of x and equality or possibly a set of equalities or equations given by h of x. Let's get started with a scalar case. That is, we consider minimization of f of a single variable x subject to g of x smaller than or equal to zero. As usual in this course, we assume that both f and g are smooth so that we can work with derivatives. Now, there are two possible scenarios. Either the minimizer x star is well inside the feasible set, the segment of the x line to the right of some given point in this case, or the minimizer is on the boundary of the feasible set, the end point of the feasible segment of line. In both cases, the necessary condition of optimality is that if we perturb x a bit, the linear approximation of the change of the cost function, so-called differential of f, must be non-negative. In other words, if we move away from the optimal x star, the cost does not improve. Now, in the former scenario, this condition imposed on the differential of f immediately translates to the condition on the derivative. We have already discussed this when considering unconstrained optimization, haven't we? Since dx can be arbitrary, we can perturb x both to the left and to the right of the, from the optimal x. The derivative must vanish at the minimum. But how about the latter scenario? Obviously, here x cannot be perturbed arbitrarily, can it? Here dx is restricted. The restriction here is pretty obvious in this simple case. dx can be non-negative only. Let's write down a formal condition that must be satisfied. The condition uses the differential of the function g of x, and it basically states that for a given dx we, do not, we can't see an increase in g. Well, within the first order approximation, of course, we are talking about differentials. Under which condition can this be accomplished? Obviously, the derivative of f and the derivative of g must have opposite signs. We can now unify the conditions for the two scenarios into one. It reads that if x is a minimizer, then there must be some non-negative coefficient mu for which this equation holds. It can perhaps go unnoticed that this kind of combination of the derivative of the cost function and the derivative of the constraint function already appeared when we discussed equality constraint optimization, right? The only difference now is that the coefficient mu, which we called a Lagrange multiplier in the equality case, is, not cons is now constrained to be non-negative. Similarly, as in the Lagrange multiplier approach for the equality constraint case, here we also have to include the original constraint when assembling the set of necessary conditions of optimality. As a matter of fact, something uh, more can be said here. Either g vanishes at the given x, or the inequality is strictly satisfied. But in that case, do we need to consider the derivative of g in the necessary condition, the, I mean, the first formula in the box above? Actually, no, and this is reflected in the condition that mu must be zero if g is strictly satisfied. As a result, we have something called complementary slackness condition. The product of mu and g of x must be zero. At least one of the two must be zero. Let's now put it all together. The set of necessary conditions of optimality that we have just assembled is called KKT conditions. KKT stands for Karush, Kuhn and Tucker, its three inventors. The individual conditions have also their names. The first one is just stationarity condition, 
just an extension of the stationary decondition well familiar to us from the unconstrained case. The second condition is also called dual feasibility constraint because it's related to the so-called dual optimization problem. However, fundamental, we will not discuss the concept of duality any further, at least not in this video. The third condition is our original constraint. Now that I have at least mentioned existence of something called dual optimization problem, this original condition is also called primal feasibility constraint. And the last uh, condition I, I have already named, uh, it's called uh, uh, the complementary slackness condition. Minor technical issue. Complementary slackness condition is not necessarily strict. This is uh, oftentimes not explicitly emphasized in texts. That is, the situation with both G of X and mu vanishing is generally not excluded. An exception is linear optimization for which complementary sensitivity is strict. Have a look at this scenario. Since the candidate point is on the boundary, g of x is zero. And since the candidate point is also a stationary point of the unconstrained optimization, derivative of f vanishes too. However, the derivative of g is not zero. In this particular case, g can be in the form of a minus x, where a is the endpoint of the interval, and the derivative at this point is one. Perhaps you can also see why strict complementarity would occur if the function f was linear. Good, we are now extending this basic insight into higher dimensional vector spaces. For the ease of visualization, consider just n equal to 2. We will only consider a single, equality first, single inequality first. That is, we only have a single scalar g function. Here, the set of values of x for which g of x is equal to zero is visualized as the red curve. This serves as the boundary of the feasible set, say the gradient points above, and we show it uh, at one particular point on the boundary, uh, which implies that the feasible set is below the curve. Recall that our inequality constraint requires that g of x is less than or equal to zero. Now, we superpose also a contour for the cost function, and let's assume a linear function. And I only plot a single contour line, the one that goes through the already considered point, which would serve as our candidate point in the analysis. Say the cost function grows in the direction towards the bottom, as sketched in the figure. Note that the whole analysis will not differ if the cost function is nonlinear, we would just approximate the contour curve going through the candidate point by a line anyway. Now comes the question. In this particular configuration, is the candidate point a minimizer? Can we find some other point in the feasible set for which the cost is smaller? Where are such improving, improving x axis located? Take a few seconds to figure it out by yourself. So, where is this? Where are these improving axes? Right over here. Can we learn a general lesson here? Have a look at the two gradients, the gradient of the constraint function g and the gradient of the cost function f. How are they related? Or, and how should they be related if uh, there is no possibility of improvement? improvement in the cost function. Clearly, the two gradients must be collinear. Right now, they are not, right? Uh, but not only that. In fact, they also must point in the opposite directions. Recall that mere collinearity was required for the equality constraints. Here, we have the additional requirement on the opposite direction. All opposite directions. Let's consider Two, con two constraints and not just one. One uh, constraint is given by the function g1 and the other is given by the function g2. The intersection of the two feasibility sets uh, is non-empty. Now consider the blue point at the intersection of the two constraint functions as the candidate point for the optimization. Gradients for the two constraints are also shown at this point. <coughs> 
Now, we'll consider some cost function, say a linear one, again, for simplicity. Its contour line that passes through the candidate point is shown together with its gradient. The obvious question is, is there any possibility of an improvement here? That is, any reduction of the cost function? Think about it again. How should the situation be changed in order to have some possibility of an improvement? It may take a few moments for you to verify that as long as the gradient of F is within the sector or cone, which is the more appropriate mathematical term, enclosed uh, between two vectors emanating from the candidate point in the uh, directions opposite to the directions of the gradients of the two constraint functions G1 and G2, there is no feasible X yielding a lower value of the cost function. We can express this using a formula that essentially states that the negative of the gradient of the cost function uh, can be expressed as a non-negative linear combination, so-called conic combination, of the two gradients. I've already alluded to the similarity with the equality constraint optimization, where the function that we have on the left-hand side is called a Lagrangian or Lagrange function, right? What's new here is that the multipliers are now constrained to be non-negative. Let me write it down here for the general case of M constraints. Identical to the scalar case that we have already discussed, here too we have to include the original primal constraints and the complementary slackness condition. Unlike in the scalar case, there is one issue that we need to discuss if uh, there are two or more constraints. Uh, but it's not completely new for us, uh, because we have already encountered it while discussing the equality constraints approached via Lagrange multiplier approach. First, we need one definition. We say that a given inequality constraint is active at a given x if uh, it is satisfied as an equality equation. Now, consider at a given candidate x only those inequalities that are active. They must satisfy some uh, regularity condition. These are called constraint qualifications, constraint qualifications uh, sometimes. And only then, if these constraint qualifications are satisfied, the KKT conditions constitute necessary conditions of optimality at a given candidate point. Among several types of constraint qualifications, the so-called linear independence constraint qualification A-R-L-I-C-Q can be used, but there are a few more. This one is uh, the one that we have already encountered while discussing uh, equality constraints, right? The gradients of the active inequality constraints must be linearly independent. So far, we have not made any assumption about the convexity of the problem. If we now restrict ourselves to convex problems, that is, the cost function and the inequality constraint functions are convex and the equality constraint function is affine. We can uh, check a uh, constraint qualification by checking if something called Slater's point exists. And Slater's point is nothing else than a point that satisfies the inequality constraint strictly. Sometimes it's also called a strictly feasible point. In fact, the condition can be made even a bit weaker by ignoring affine inequality constraints. Slater's point must only be strictly feasible with respect to those uh, other nonlinear constraints other than those affine ones. Let me emphasize that unlike in the previous uh, uh, constraint constraint qualification based on linear independence of gradients or regularity condition if you like here we are not analyzing what's going on what's going on at the candidate point we are just asking if there is any such strictly feasible point and this is uh, commonly much easier to verify and therefore it's quite pleasant to have this possibility in the, in for convex problems so, let me summarize it all in one slide. Here it goes. No further comments needed. Right. Copy this into your cheat sheet.
We can also rewrite uh, these conditions in a vector format. All the equations and inequalities are to be interpreted in the element-wise manner. Perhaps the term nabla G deserves some comment. It's a matrix composed of gradients of the individual constraints stacked horizontally, just uh, one next to each other. Therefore, it is a transpose of a Jacobian for the constraints, following the common conventions. Perhaps let me also comment on the form of the complementary slackness condition. It's indeed correct in this form, because uh, don't forget that we are also enforcing the non-negativity conditions on the elements of mu. Finally, as I have announced at the beginning, we are going to consider both inequality and equality constraints. We assume constraint qualifications, which reduces to existence of Slater's point in the convex case. And now note that by assuming convexity, we automatically imply that the equality constraints are affine or linear, if you like, to keep the constant term on the right hand side of the inequality. And we do not have to worry about qualification of these constraints. Linear constraints are automatically qualified. This is another type of constraint qualification called linear constraint qualification, apparently, LCQ. And this we have here in the convex case. And again, the full set of conditions also worth copying into a cheat sheet. There's another reason for popularity of convex optimization besides the possibility to prove constraint qualification by just proving existence of Slater's point. And that is, the KKT conditions are not only necessary but also sufficient. This is really remarkable and very useful because in the general case we would have to go for the for some second order conditions as we did in equality constraint case and analyze these, some kind of projected Hessians. For a convex problem with inequality constraints, as soon as we find one point satisfying the KKT conditions, we found the optimal one. Again, existence of Slater's point is necessary for the KKT conditions to correctly work as necessary conditions of optimality, of course. And that's it. We will go through some simple examples elsewhere but the fact is that rather than a practical method for finding optimal solutions, perhaps with the exception of small and simple problems, the KKT conditions are rather a foundational theoretical result. And various derivative-based numerical optimization algorithms can be viewed as uh, iterative schemes for solving the KKT conditions by relaxing this or that constraint and relying on convergence. We will have a look at these in some other video.